Welcome back to our long-form podcast series on the gods of Conan. In our episodes so far, we've covered the gods of the games, various beastman races, and the best gods for those seeking to slaughter evil. However, today, we'll be evening that playing field with the best gods for villains of high adventure. As a disclaimer, this is mostly an unscripted video, thus I may misspeak on lore issues. I claim no lore master status despite the source list below the chapters in the description box. In addition, the term Great Old One in this series simply means means that the god in question comes from the Cthulhu mythos, and is not to be confused with their classification in that mythos itself, which deserves its own video. Today we're going to be talking about an outer god in particular, and I do refer to them as an outer god in their introduction. Now, don your dark cloaks, gather your evil artifacts, and prepare the virgin sacrifices. No, not that guy. As we begin. Grimdark. Half off! If you'd like to see my progress as I make new content, enlist today through YouTube memberships or Patreon to become a soldier in the Grimdark Legion. My thanks to the men and women who've already served, whose names are listed here. You keep darkness at an affordable price. Once, Ishtar was likely a divine female incarnation of Mitra, but in modern times, the outer god Shabnigaroth subverted the worshippers of this goddess, slowly turning them into secretive cults dedicated to the black goat of the woods, only using Ishtar as a cover. Known as the mother with a thousand young and the wife of Yog sothoth her worshippers are blessed with healthy offspring in exchange for dark deeds of worship. These include, but are not limited to, blood orgies, human sacrifice, and what can only be described as xeno-bestiality. So, let's start by rehashing and expanding on Sandy Peterson's points on the name Black Goat of a Thousand Young, and from there we'll move into the connections with the Cthulhu Mythos, because obviously it's an outer god and the Cthulhu Mythos also exists in Conan, very directly. It's not like some hidden piece of media, it's a very direct connection. What she did during the end of Elder Knight, very unique there. I was very surprised to learn that. And then go further into the fun monsters and allies a villain using this god would have access to. Now, one of the fun things about Shabnigaroth is that even though the cults are so diverse, they have this camaraderie to them. Because each of them have a different interpretation of Shabnigaroth as a life-giving love, sort of mother goddess figure, uh, to the point where one thing we're going to get into a little bit later, satyrs. Ugh, satyrs. I, I don't like the demon mommy milky. I don't like that. That's It's, base, it's really gross, but that's what we're going to do. We're getting into it. This is, I will say, before we go any further, I just want to add this brief note. Of the outer gods of the court of Azathoth, you know, Nyarlathotep has this whole thing where his connections to the dreamlands make him hate his job, and he becomes a very relatable figure, uh, where he's almost Jim Halpert from The Office to some degree, goofing off as he's tormenting souls of the innocent, but it's like just a prank bro, and he's just miserable otherwise. Um, Yog sothoth almost has an old man personality to him when fully manifested, not to be confused with his Yog manifestation, which is really more just one of his horrors or one of his masks that he wears, but his cannibal god is much more savage. However, uh, him as a cannibal god is much more savage. However, the fully manifested version has a kids these days mentality and was always very neutral and dismissive of humanity, but you can earn his respect if you love knowledge enough and are willing to sacrifice your sanity for it. The thing about Shub is just the fact that, man, you know, we'll call her Ishtar, she does not have a personality she does not care. She only exists to give life. Her will is totally unknown, and of the Outer Gods, she is the one who best represents the concept, because she is simply an entity. Not an entity with will or desire other than procreation, but merely an entity. One concept I actually want to go over again before we go any further is that we talked about the wife of Yogg. Well, she was also the mate of Hastor. She was the mate of almost everything in the Cthulhu mythos because in many ways she is the void and going into Sandy Peterson's breakdown of the black part of the name black goat of the forest with a thousand young is that you know the black element here is not referring to a literal physical form but possibly very likely and this is what I took away from his dissection of it which is the blackness of the void it's literally very much similar to 
Nyarlathotep's concept of nothingness, which is, of course, very ironic because Nyarlathotep is the most personified of the outer gods, Shub is really embodies the term. She is void. She is nothingness. She is very specifically the primal concept. So uh, cavemen, early religions, they had a concept of darkness, that darkness wasn't merely the absence of light, but rather that darkness emanated from a source. And Shub, in many ways, is that source. The dark young are that source. We'll going over them a little later. But that that is what she is. She is the primal source of darkness. And so when we say black, we mean that dark black void, but darkness as a living thing. So think darkness as a living thing. That is the black of the black goat. And then obviously the goat imagery, and I have to give full credit to Sandy Peterson on this one because this is a great contextualization of it. The Migo, who were originally the, the fungi... Uh, creatures, the fungi, crustacean, bug men, who are also not fungi, crustacean, bug men, because they're matter from another universe, but also not matter from another universe, but also matter from this universe, which is more cosmic and horrific than we would like to believe. These guys, who do these crazy lab experiments on humans, accidentally, likely, transmitted the knowledge of Shubnigaroth as this kind of mother goddess to a human brain once, and the way the human brain, brain manifested this, and uh, the, the Migo are most famous for using humans like lab rats, usually in the experiment of body swapping. So I, I could easily see one of the less ethical Migo, if they even have ethics, one of the great, one, well-written uh, creatures, because we still don't know much about their psychology, but a less ethical Migo literally using a Migo in an experiment, switching a Migo consciousness for a human consciousness, and them learning about the religion that way, which is what Sandy Peterson theorizes. I really love that idea because the human mind then contextualizes that, and this is this is bringing it into my theory, the human mind contextualizes their version of a mother goddess as something similar here, the black goat. Goats give milk, and in the, in the in quotes milk, which is secreted by the udders of Shabnigarath, is actually one of the things that allows for the mutations into satyrs. And this is very, very, very cool. So let's let's get a little bit further into that. Expanding further, the general point about satyrs, satyrs being these kinds of, and this is, I'll just straight up cover them here. They are human-animal hybrids specifically, but specifically it's more like they unlock within man, because again, this is also concepts of reality warping, and generally the way Sandy Peterson does it, because I really love his take on satyrs, because he really takes it away from just being billy goat people to being genuinely, you know, human owl hybrids, human horse hybrids, human moose hybrids, which is which all look phenomenal. His adventure panacea, you should really, really check out. I left a link to Seth Skorakowski's review of it on uh, in our source list. But just the fact that these are animals or humans who imbibe some way, in the Adventure Panacea, it's a pill, but who imbibe some way the milk of Shabnigarath. And once they do this, they start to mutate and gain the features of, a lot like a gangrel from World of Darkness, the features of an animal that they most identify with, or just random animals. Though I do like the idea of a satyr being primarily made up of person and a singular animal. You could easily mix and match the features, have these goat hooves with... Uh, you could really look like, if you wanted to, the Jebel Sog representation in Conan Exiles, if you so desired, which would be really, really cool. But I also really love this. Going back to the concept of black as living void darkness... And black as living void darkness within the primal mind, it's really our intuition and our intuitive minds when looking at a dark space. The reason that, you know, some people, they even as adults, get scared when they're washing their hair because they don't want to close their eyes because they're, you know, there's like, ah, demon. And it's like, but that's what it is. It's the fear of the unknown and the unpredictable. The credit I really want to give to Shabnigaroth and the writing of H.P. Lovecraft is that while most of the cosmicist writing of H.P. Lovecraft is usually very comforting in a way, because there's a dark, you know, chill-out factor to, yeah, of course it's scary, of course everything's going to die and burn away, and there's almost like a, a chill, active nihilism to the whole thing. But with Shub, man... Man, does she actually scare me because she cannot be reasoned with. Because it's like dealing with some type of... Because the, the Deep Ones are amphibians, but that amphibians 
you know, the amphibious aspect, it's skin deep. It's skin deep because ultimately they are creatures who on some level you could possibly reason with if they don't murder you. However, when I am dealing with an amphibian or a fish, one of the scariest things about that is that they are not really capable of being reasoned with in some cases. When you're dealing with a less intelligent creature of any variety, that is always scary. Especially one of titanic size and infinite power that could easily destroy you like Shub. So that's the real point I want to give to Shub, is that she actually scares me. Not much in the Cthulhu Mythos does, you know, like there, there are different fears, it doesn't hit like that, but Shub really masters both cosmic creeping dread horror and gothic horror all at once, just immediately hits both. There is a great reason to use Shub as Ishtar, as a homebrew adventure campaign in almost any session. If you're looking to homebrew a monster, well, look, the, the A Thousand Young, that's the last bit of the name breakdown, The Thousand Young is literally just an exaggeration, again, me taking from Sandy Peterson, is an exaggeration for Infinite Young. It's just a way to symbolize near infinite young. You want a homebrew monster in Conan, a, an abomination of Ishtar, an abomination of Shibnigarath, is exactly what will work. All right, so let's talk about easily one of the most unique uses of Shub's power. Because the thing about it is this. Obviously, if you're doing an Ishtar cult, you will have your own prayers, your own homebrew prayers, your own homebrew phase of the moon that this will be done on, etc., etc. They differ dramatically, as I said previously. But again, there's this inherent connection. And just to show how diverse this is, Out of the Aeons has this amazing section where the literal, I guess you could say the divorce of Yogg and Shub during the time of Old Night. So in Conan, this is very relevant because this was when humanity was first kind of inheriting the Earth as the dominant species. And one of the first thing that happens, the, one of the first things is that Shub takes a side against her most used mate, who is Yogg. And this is pretty amazing stuff because Shub, an outer god, is literally, not in a backhanded way, but just outwardly taking the side of humanity. And if it makes sense, because the time of Old Night was also a time of war. And the things that specifically were being warred with were demons. Now, this makes a lot of sense if you understand Shub's purpose. Now, we already went over how Shub sort of likes to mutate things. Don't worry, we'll get deeper into that. But she likes to mutate things and have things breed with other things and breed with and make more biological life. Well, the demon gods, the old elder demons, they weren't those things. They were astral entities, divine entities, above at this point. This So, out of an alliance of convenience, and I just find this so interesting, she takes the side of and aids humanity against demonic hordes. And all of this from a story about weird living mummies and the evil stuff that demons were doing to people, where it was actually a lot of crossover with our next god, Ajujo, because one of the demon gods that she defeats and, and kills uh, under the behest of a priest is that Shub defeats this demon god that was sticking people into living mummies, like they were pe being petrified and turned into this, this thing that had its brain and consciousness kept alive as its body was fully petrified and aged and died, and it was just horrific. But she defeated them at the behest of a priest and cult. And that goes into really what we're talking about here. It's about the cult in question. Now, of course, the way to get Shub's favor, that doesn't change too much. So she's still basically Conan Slanesh in the sense that you're, you're going to be banging a demon. You're going to be banging an, a Xeno, magical, you know, evil, satyr, mutant, demon, dark, young from the, the, it's awful, it's bad. It's, there's a reason she's still an evil god, but I really love that this is just such an interesting character-filled part of history for Shub and for the cults of Shub because it gives you an idea that no matter how hedonistic and gross, sick, twisted, and morally debauched and murderous these cults are, no matter how much they are sacrificing virgins on an altar, followed by a blood orgy, followed by banging a horse with, like, a dragon fire-breathing butt or whatever, 
no matter how much that happens, the cults of Shub are always pro-biological life, even as gross, insane, complex, and destructive of humanity that can get in, again, there's another overlap with the Beastmen, obviously with the Satyrs, but there's that other overlap with the Beastmen from Warhammer, where you have this uh, thematic overlap, obviously, that they're not in the same universe, but where you do have this kind of thing that is worshipping the ever-changing mutations of these animal men that then go out and try to spread more life, no matter how abominable it may be. It's an ocean of creation and chaos, and that can make a good force against demons. So, Shub, if you are trying to do an anti-demon cult, and then, like, oh god, that would be so good. So, you have an Ishtar cult. And the Ishtar cult originally looked like good guys to the party that you have if you're a dungeon master. And you can use them that way. It's like, oh, it's a cult of Ishtar. Ishtar, it's, it's just like, it's, it's basically just Mitra but female, you know? No big deal, it's just Mitra but female. It's like, okay, cool, you know? I'll, I'll, that's, that's great, let's, let's do that. And it's like, nope, blood orgy. And that's great, because you, like, you go in to defeat demons and then act, nope, blood orgy, but for different reasons. And I, I, really, I really do enjoy that. That's an interesting bit of history. So, one big element you're going to get, and you should use this as much as possible, I-E-B-O-N, Ibon. So the Book of Ibon is a grimoire, and it is a grimoire largely containing all of the various tactics and practices and beliefs and ways to summon through ritual various different entities connected to Shabnigaroth. And one thing that you're going to find about these entities is that all of them are mutated elements of other parts of either the Conan or Cthulhu mythos. Now, I could start with the Dark Young because they're the most iconic, but I'd rather start with the Little People because they're easily my favorite. They're literally just a cult of degenerate serpent folk, that is to say serpent folk who've downgraded to the point where they have intelligence on par with humans, who basically drank the milk of Shub and became more lizard-like and tiny and far more violent. And so they've became sort of these uh, pygmy serpent folk, the really lizard folk, tiny lizard folk, new lizard folk is what the little people are, and they have become these kinds of extremely savage, simple goblin things that just run around and stab and kill whatever they can and can be summoned up with a simple blood ritual or sacrifice, similar to most of these. Most of these require a blood orgy-like sacrifice or a blood sacrifice of some type. When it comes to little people, just insanely fun. Then the Toko Toko, they're a first example of humans taking the milk of Shabnigroth and then mixing that into an herbal elixir and herbal remedy that sort of over time allows them to do things like disconnect their body parts, um, it do effectively ghoul-like things. In many ways, they are to some degree considered ghouls, but they have far more abilities than that. They're naturally psychic and have abilities in that way. They use it to enhance their consciousness. Toko Toko are likely the only truly psychic, other than the Dark Young. The Dark Young also have psychic abilities, but they're in many ways the only, I would say, they mutate in the direction of intellect because in some ways they've unlocked through their own specific type of sorcery and cannibalism a way, likely through fusing actually the milk of Shabnigroth with specific cannibalistic rituals similar to ghouls to prevent the loss of their intellect and then triple down on it for psionic capabilities because one of the things if you've played the uh, Isle of Sipta expansion with the Toko Toko people in Conan Exiles, they have the ability to send out this psychic wave, and that's a, a toned-down version of what they can do because they really do have effectively a form of psychokinesis, which allows them to do all their crazy stuff. You can technically consider them a type of undead, but again, it's better to fit them in that very specific and unique black goat category of entities, similar to the little people, which, I, again, I just really love because they're stupid, crazy, like, lizard goblins that just stab everything, and I love them. You may have noticed a theme so far. When ghouls imbibe the milk of Shabnigroth and convert to that worship, they tend to become something like the Toko Toko people. When serpent men do it, they become something like the little people. So it clearly interacts with different entities in different ways, but what about when just simply raw humans, no rituals, no extra stuff interacts with this milk? 
well, they become the satyrs. It's also true for when humans do. I once again reference the Sandy Peterson adventure Panacea because it has some great examples of this, humans just casually becoming goat-like, other humans becoming owl-like, etc. But also dogs that develop human-like heads and the ability to speak and gain consciousness. Some very good body horror stuff. I would go so far as to say satyrs are most effective from a horror perspective when it's an animal that gains human-like sentience and the ability to speak, but it still has the lack of inhibition of a beast. So a particularly angry and savage animal that just has a bad personality gains this ability to use human speech and intellect, but they're already this hulking great wolf or lion. As something even like a wolf beast, we went over those in our Werewolves and Conan video, but a demon-possessed wolf then also gets the milk of Shabnigaroth, and you get this kind of talking man-headed wolf thing that just looks like something out of a psychedelic nightmare, and it's chasing you through the woods, crying and screaming like a baby as it slowly learns to speak and then tell you why you suck before it kills you, and it's just great. So, satyrs, phenomenal stuff. If you want any kind of homebrew monster mash, satyrs are where you go to, but again, remember, it's Shabnigroth, so your homebrews are very, very welcome here. So, for most cults, they will still have their own individual moon phase and everything, but if you want the safest possible and most powerful Shub cult, then that's going to come from the New Moon cults. Because if you offer a blood sacrifice on a New Moon and perform a ritual to Shub, you can suffer, summon the living tank of Shub worshippers, of Ishtar cultists in this setting, and that is the Dark Young. And the Dark Young are pretty amazing. They are about the size of giants. Actually, if we're using Conan giants, Conan giants are about the same size as normal vanilla Skyrim giants in a way, so they're about, I would say a little taller than that if you count the tentacles, because the tentacles make them like twice the, the size and length, but they're these incredibly tree-sized, we'll say, entities that look like what many people assume Shabnigaroth's physical form, should she ever manifest, would look like, but obviously smaller, which in this case is to say a mansion-sized giant thing made of a mass of writhing black tentacles with four goat legs at the bottom. And this entity literally will just exist as an extension of the will of Shub, and as we already went over, she doesn't have much will, but she does have a love of life, and obviously a maternal feeling of protection over her young. And so the Dark Young, while not an actively threatening force, will enact the will of, it seems, and this is the way Panacea, again by Sandy Peterson, plays it, will initially simply act as a protecting force, but then as it stays summoned and it stays around, remember, it doesn't just go away after the night of the new moon, but on the night of the new moon, after the blood sacrifice is offered, when it's summoned, it will slowly begin to adopt the personality and desires of the cult. And this is a beautiful thing, too, because this entity had no... Per now, it might look grotesque and horrific, but it's a new life. It had no personality until it was birthed into existence when you summoned it. And what you did was you infected it with the cult. And a great storyline here, a great way to open a storyline, would be a cultist trying to leave. They've rediscovered their humanity. They've discovered how horrible what they've done is. They had a, a coming to Mitra moment, as you would say in Conan. And they realize they need to get out of there. They need to get out of there. They need to run. But the Dark Young, which has the same psychic abilities that, say, a Toko Toko would have, knows that they're about to run. And so a tentacle comes up from behind and breaks their neck and then consumes them whole, converting their mass into something like a few baby Dark Young, which I would probably homebrew that. I love the idea of tiny Dark Young running around because the first Dark Young is there and anything it eats, it just poops out more Dark Young. I would love that, but you know, obviously weaker, weaker ones, but uh, tinier ones. I'd like a pocket-sized Dark Young that just beats the crap out of my enemies. It'd be funny. Anyway. The Dark Young are phenomenal, living tanks, just very iconic for Shub, on a new moon. Just the Book of Ibon, E-I-B-O-N, Ibon. Look it up. It's a, mad, it's a great tool. It usually comes in the form of a scroll with a skull on it. I absolutely love this god. I absolutely love that it scares the crap out of me. Now moving on from the Black Goat, 
to the god of the Black Ones. The beautiful and most enchanting thing about the Hyborian Age is that we are like archaeologists looking into a forgotten time covered up by the ages. Nowhere is that more true than Azuzho, who is responsible to the best of our knowledge for the nightmarish state of almost all of southwestern Hyboria, unleashing his children, known as the Black Ones and Grey Ones respectively, upon the area. It is likely that they were only beaten back when the population discovered they were unwilling to fight fight other demons. Using this weakness, many turn to the dark gods as well as mythos entities for aid, which explains the often demonologist or elder magic focused societies one might find there. So to talk about a Jujo is to talk about the Tambalku tribes, and the Tambalku tribes were the ancient civilization of the Black Ones, these demon supremacists. Uh, during the time when they were in full force, they were in full function, uh, slowly over time trying to take back the Earth by converting various different humans to his worship, possessing these humans with demonic spirits, making them undergo a great ritual in which they are dunked into a pool, a ceiling ritual, but instead emerge as crystal-skinned, either black or gray in some cases ones, basically just ones, and they are the children of the Dark One. And actually, the Dark One is very fitting, because Azuzho in many ways is the king of dark gods, in the sense of dark meaning demon gods in this sense. Because when we talk about the demon gods, we're usually talking about entities that originally were these astral divine beings that had to deal with the fact that their homeland, Earth, was taken from them by humans and divine beings rising up against them. The way they cope with that trauma defines how they act as demons when they're in the world. For a Zhuzhou, it's very straightforward. Nah, demons are it. Demons are what we're doing, and if you're not a demon, you're screwed. And that's basically it. This is why he's willing to fight Elder Gods. It's the reason he's willing to fight Outer Gods. It's the reason he's willing to fight humans. It's the reason he's willing to fight everything that isn't a demon. But as soon as other demons come along, the Tambalku Empire, it just almost immediately collapsed overnight because the whole dream these demons were fighting for, especially these specific hybrid entities, so there's this thing called heraldry, it's when you become a half-demon in Conan, you can actually pray to a demon, replace half of your soul with that demon's power, and become a half-demon. When you are a herald of a Jujo, you become a black one, you become a gray one, depending on the general nature of the ritual. If you undergo the pools, you will likely become a black one, meaning if you try yourself to become a herald of a Jujo while also undergoing the same sealing ritual that they use to lock people in small statues as a form of imprisonment, uh, then you will likely become a black one, which is a crystal-skinned, somewhat giant figure. It's very cool, very powerful obsidian giants that are ready to slaughter all around them. But if you do not use that, that is likely what causes the Grey One appearance, because we often see from the Grey Ones in Isle of Sipta that they are more flesh-colored. They have a lot in common with Acheronian demon souls that possess humans and cause them to mutate, so that seems to be normal heraldry. But regardless, in both cases, we see an erasure of personality, which does not usually happen in heraldry. In heraldry, usually you retain your personality, you gain a little bit of the will of the demon, but you are in control, and you know your power comes from that source, and really what makes you generally a force for evil when you become a herald is the fact that you're already very committed to that demon god to become a herald of them. But in the case of the Black Ones, we always see a clear erasure of identity. It's always a clear erasure of identity. Right, so back to the Tumbalku tribes. The Tumbalku tribes collapsed almost overnight once they had a literal dark god worshipping southwestern Hyboria rising up against them because if you're fighting for demon supremacy, if you're fighting for demons to take back the earth, because it's pretty clear that the tricky business, so to speak, that Azuzho did, and this is sort of foreshadowed by the sealing magic, it seems pretty implicit that they accidentally, accidentally, that when you become a black one or a gray one, your will is replaced with the will of a Zhuzhou. And so, fully and completely, the desire to take back the earth for demons 
comes about in you, and you are willing to go to war with everything, but seeing that there were all these civilizations that were able to make deals with demons, appease demons, work for demons, around demons, doing demon-adjacent activities would have been an incredible destruction to both Ajujo himself, as well as the morale of every black and gray one there. Because the whole point was to take back human Earth for the demons, if demons are already there, and demons are already living it up, one of the examples we're going to get to later is the true gods, and the true gods have a demon that's just more than happy to sit where he is, then what's the point? And so now you have these sort of cults of the Black Ones that do generally do what they do, but I guess they're content, and that would make a lot of sense, that in the face of being so thoroughly demoralized, which is what would happen in the event of a demon uprising against a demon supremacy movement, because the, what's the point? You eventually get to a point where you still believe in your cause, but you're okay with doing it incredibly slowly. And so the, the retreat all the way back to the Isle of the Black Ones, which is just almost an ocean now, away from where their territories previously stood. And that retreat back to places like Tortage and places that are off the coast of really south, it's still southwestern Hyboria, but it's along the further north of the coast. And that dramatic reduction in territory, it makes sense because now the goal is slow growth. It's slowly hoping that other demons see the light of a Jujo. It's a peaceful convert of other demons with a forced convert of humans and other groups. When it comes to the Black Ones and magic, they're two unique trademarks, and by proxy, the unique trademarks of any Ajujo cult would be the hypnosis spells and hypnosis magic they do through dancing. So this dancing is done to induce a kind of religious euphoria and experience, which also activates the spell in the dancer to be able to be applied to those observing the dance. And this creates this kind of hypnosis which will keep them locked in place until the end of a sealing ritual. And this makes up for, and is also of course very complementary. this is what in the Conan universe in the expanded Mongoose publishing aspect of the Book of Skilos, which expands on the magic, they would call this mesmerism. So they're known for mesmerism and also the sealing magic. This, of course, as I just said, makes up for the fact that the sealing magic often takes a long time to perform. But again, we go into this. Why seal things like Giant Kings? Why seal things like Thunha? Why seal things like Migo and all these other entities? Well, I think the goal is pretty simple. The goal is brainwashing. And so from here, you can get an idea of the kind of caste system or hierarchy that Ajujo wants to set up, and also the kind that existed during the Tumbalku Empire. Remember that the Tumbalku, well, Tumbalku Empire, the Tumbalku tribes, but they might as well have been an empire? I'll call it the Tumbalku Empire. During the Tumbalku Empire, and the reason, the other reason I use that term is because they were the southern neighbors of Acheron while all this Black One stuff was happening for the first time, Acheron was rising and falling. But the hierarchy would have gone demons on top, humans and other entities as servants and slaves and worshippers on the bottom. So why not just kill? I think the sealing mechanism is a form of brainwashing. And that the longer you stay in one of those statues, the more you will revert to a sort of savage, consciousnessless state where you can be plied, you can be controlled, you can be indoctrinated, and eventually you can be used as a herald, or if your will is broken, you can be broken into being a slave of a Jujo and the black slash gray ones. I'm actually reminded of the oldest concept of what a zombie is in old, old tribal rituals, the idea that a person was under hypnosis rather than any kind of undead. And this plays into that very nicely. To be a zombie in that sense is to be a servant of the person who controls you and has control over you. And that's obviously the whole theme here, toteming equaling control. So to be a zombie of a Jujo would be to be a servant of a Jujo. And so you would have the black ones, the zombies on the bottom, black ones in the middle, a Jujo on top, and the rest of the demon gods on top. And of course, on top of where? Earth. 
taking it fully back for demon kind. So why would a normal human from the Black Kingdoms, the Black Coast, or Stygia, these being the general places where the modern Azuzio cults are, want to worship this entity? Well, the reason mainly is a promise of power, but also an enlightenment philosophy. It's very similar, and a great comparison is the Acheron Revivalist movement that exists in Stygia. In Stygia, the Acheron Revivalist movement, despite all history saying to the contrary that the ancestors of the Stygians did not do very well in the great demon empire of Acheron, well, that doesn't really matter, because also, there are a bunch of disenfranchised youth, there are a bunch of disenfranchised, all these people in modern decadent uh, sort of Stygia that are eager to jump on any bandwagon promising them a better economic and social tomorrow and the same decadent lives that likely powerful sorcerers enjoy in their uh, current hierarchy of civilization. In the same way that they enjoy those decadent lives, we could take that back to the Black Kingdoms and the Black Coast and we get a simple sense of military or militant power. It's easy to encounter a gray or black one ruined temple and find what are basically these powerful warriors that stand at, you know, the black ones are very tall. The black ones and gray ones are both very tall, about, uh, I would say, at least 25% larger than a fairly tall human. And so they're tall, they're strong, they're capable. You're not aware that you're joining a cult that's going to erase your mind and put you into a hive-like state. No, you don't understand that. What you have is a cult, a cult -like, genuine cult-like mentality. That is preying on people who are weak, preying on people who are misguided, and promising them that they will get stronger, but in exchange for that strength, they lose their identity. You can even have an entire concept where the concept of demonic supremacy or becoming a demon, this kind of power, enlightenment, or fairly unintelligent or barely even researched dark sorcerers come around and they sit around and they, they, they think, aha, well, I know what heraldry is. This'll be just fine. But it's not. It's not fine. You say you're fine, but you're not fine. You're a black one. In more philosophical Stygia, you could have a concept where demon supremacy or becoming a demon is a form of enlightenment or, you know, this sort of master demon race evolution. Uh, and then on the Black Coast, where almost everything is ruled by piracy, of course, that symptom of power is there. I think a Black Coast story where someone, say, escapes a Black One cult or is coming from a Black One cult is definitely one that is... It's still going to resonate. It's going to hit home. Because you have this very simple story of someone who wants to become strong, goes about it the wrong way, and nearly loses who's the, who they are as a result and needs to find a new thing, and so that makes a great segue into joining an adventurer party. And that's pretty much all for Azuzio himself. Azuzio is pretty simple, I would say. Hypnosis plus sealing magic equals Azuzio. Uh, there's always more to go over with that. It's so unexpanded, because what I've gone over in many cases are theories. Absolutely, but they're so implicit, they're so in your face, they're so there that nothing else makes sense for the current state of southwestern Hyboria. It really doesn't. And with humans having this tendency to slowly over time and over the generations reject demonic influence, we also see as the Hyborian age ends, as we move away from that, how those dark or demon gods fell into obscurity and how all the dark gods slowly became obscure and in the shadows during the time of Solomon Cain in the later 1700s and you know, 1800s. And speaking of strange, obscure theories, let's move on to our next god, Yun, and the Cult of the Yellow Skull. If you'd like to practice your own sealing magic, then you'll need today's sponsor, Ronin Craft. Ronin Craft is an independent 3D model printing service with an excellent customer review score on Etsy. Specializing in both fantasy and sci-fi, he's the perfect match for all your tabletop needs. Because with Ronin Craft, you'll get quality that surpasses any master. Yun is a tragic god from a power perspective, doomed to play second fiddle to the Scarlet Circle of Katai forever. While we have Yun as a demon god, many have linked the figure to Cthulhu's half-brother Hastor, also known as the King in Yellow. Whereas his brother influences much of the West, at this time, Yun influences the East. This theory is supported by the constantly comically failed assassination attempts against the Emperor of Katai, who is the political enemy of the Cult of the Yellow Skull, Yun's primary worshippers. The theory holding 
that this is not Hastor's true goal for his followers. One concept that I'd like to cover before we go any further with this god is the unique concept of Yun's followers having people pay them for the specific type of necromancy that they perform, and it's specifically to be able to have fluent conversations with dead relatives or ancestors. And this kind of unique paid necromancy, dealing specifically with aspects of memory, sanity, these concepts are incredibly important to Hastor Yun connections. Because once you understand that their version of necromancy, very unique to the Cult of the Yellow Skull, is playing with very fluid, very accurate depictions of memory, and that one of their rituals deals with a lotus flower, with them actually going mad for a temporary time to be able to can be converted to the religion or learn that specific style of necromancy, it becomes an obvious illusion to Carcosan sort of magic the sort of kingdom of lost dreams in a way. And Carcosa being sort of, I would argue to some degree, if we're using Conan logic, it would definitely be part of the outer dark and this sort of realm ruled by the king in yellow. And this idea of slowly wanting to bring about a mad emperor, that might be one of his goals, but obviously they can't happen overnight. It can't just be, you know, this or that random, oh, well, we just assassinated the emperor and now random new guy is in charge. It has to be some ordained person who can both handle the insanity of the hallucinogenic lotus rituals and master the specific type of necromancy while also being slowly infected by the king in yellow to the point point where he can literally bring about Carcosa on Earth. And from here, we can go further into the idea of Hastor as Yun. Now we go into the specific theology of the Cult of the Yellow Skull and how they contextualize in their place in Katai their view of the figure of Yun or Hastor as the Emperor of the Underworld, and how the Emperor of the Underworld must bless or ordain, in the same way we just went over, the person who will be the true future Emperor of Katai, and of course the theological aspect of that, how things are taken and sort of the whisper game is played, and down the line you have all these different members of the Cult of the Yellow Skull who either think they are the ordained future Emperor, or they think that this next new person will be. So you have all these failed assassination attempts because you have all these false emperors not truly blessed by Hastor, and we don't know really when he will unveil this plan. So I have this little timeline in my head of how I think things will go. So we already went over how their sort of failed assassination attempts of the Emperor of Katai make sense, because obviously that isn't the time yet. It's not the time for their prophesied messiah figure to come, their insane messiah figure to come it makes a lot more sense when they understand that when we understand that madness brings them closer to the divine so the end game of the emperor of katai being this figure that is largely controlled by the cult of the yellow skull who is at this point fully enlightened to carcosa and fully enlightened to the will of hastor now this makes me think that Hastor, who is characterized as being much crueler in effect than Cthulhu, is actually trying to make them into mad, overpowered necromancers until one day they are strong enough to perform regime change to put an actual mad emperor on the throne. Remember, they consider madness close to divinity, and if madness is going to increase their ability to, when mixed with necromancy, and this is of course great, it's what's so great about Ishtar instead of just doing Shabnigaroth, or doing Yun instead of just Hastor, is that we're mixing the necromancy that exists in the world plus the magic of Hastor, the king in yellow, to create something totally new, which is that kind of, hey, it's necromancy, but it's memory focused, which we usually don't see. It's, remember, zombies are usually very, very much that kind of brain dead stereotype in this universe, savage, hungry, bloodthirsty, and almost always demonic in nature. But in this case, this kind of unique yellow sign, if you will, necromancy, bringing people back from the dead to be able to talk. Now, man, that's amazing. That's amazing for uniqueness in the setting. 
Because what you have, when we take that back to hallucination rituals and that lotus flower that they ingest causing madness, madness bringing them closer to divinity, and that divinity being really the source of power for their magic, is you have this idea that over time they become madder and more insane, crazy necromancers capable effectively, I guess you could say it's kind of an ectomancy, but it's more like bringing back these lucid and very surreal people. And you can just imagine people having almost full resurrections, but being these zombie humans, effectively, is who they're talking to. And ghosts just fully lucid, walking around the world. It creates a very dreamlike setting, but also it's a way to create a very powerful army. And what we could be seeing is the sort of Acheron of the East, in a way, that's in the making. And obviously we know later that this doesn't really pan out in many of the Hyborian times timelines, but it would be a very interesting alternative future. So I believe from here, he will in turn act as kind of an emissary to Carcosa on Earth, and this kind of Carcosa on Earth filled with, again, mad zombies, mad ghosts, mad necromancers, centered in Katai, but then expanding all over the world, which is very cool, uh, will usher in the sort of manifestation of the King in Yellow, whenever he so desires, giving him a foothold on Earth and bringing Carcosa effectively to Earth. And the sort of final note on this being that the symbol for Yun could be one of the interpretations for the yellow sign. Now, people often wrongfully associate the yellow sign with the specific image of Robert W. Chambers' book, and that's actually something done randomly by an artist, but it's actually never actually uh, specified. The yellow sign looks different to every person who perceives it. Of course, much like with Shubnigaroth, I really like the idea of Yun acting as the face of Hastor in Katai. These are the priests of Yun. They will let me talk to my ancestors if I pay them gold. And also, when they are teaching necromancy, and I don't specify this on the page, so I want to make a clarification to what's on the page with in front of you, which is that it's not that they have to perform human sacrifice every time they talk to the dead, but rather a recently dead corpse will make a better vessel for speaking to the dead. So it is a bonus if you are looking to employ their services that you are capable of sacrificing someone to Histoire. However, you can simply use a corpse as well, though if the vocal cords are already petrified, then what's the use in trying to speak to something that can't talk? The final note on geography being that they are located in that famous place of Purple Towered Pai Kang, and you've heard that reference several times, but that's pretty much it. They're headquartered there, that's about it. They're still very well known and have headquarters literally all over Katai. I do kind of like the underworld Pope view they have of Hastor. I really do like the comparisons in a way to being blessed by underworld Pope who is also crazy. Crazy underworld Pope. That's great. Moving on. In the Conan universe, to be a thief is also to be a murderer. Nowhere is that better represented than in the six-armed elephant-headed god, Bell, worshipped nomadically across the supercontinent. Wielding six swords and accompanied by an undead thief army, Bell embodies the most comical interpretation of Might Makes Right. There are really two sides to Bell. And the first one is that of a very powerful banditry god. Because when we're talking about thieves in Conan, it really does make more sense to call it banditry, especially after this heavy influence of Skyrim. When you think of banditry, you think of robbing someone at a roadside, or if they are breaking into your house, very obviously killing the person and then taking the valuables. Because that is what we are talking about Bell being the sort of might makes right god of. But the reason I use the word comical is that you could also think of him as a thief nerd. And I want to go ahead and get my favorite part about Bell out of the way first. Firstly, he's a nomadic god. We don't actually know. It might have been Vendhaya that he originated from. I'm sort of judging by the elephant head, but we don't really know. But he's a nomadic god, worshipped almost everywhere. But his priests, priests of this god, must never buy or trade for anything. If they do, redemption... Can, so if you do buy or trade for anything, you've already, you're sullying your name in the eyes of Bell. You're sullying your name in the eyes of Bell because he is that strict about you being a thief. He is that autistic about thieving. If you do buy or trade for anything, the only way you can redeem yourself is by stealing something of ten times greater value to regain your favor in the eyes of your god. 
And that is amazing to me when you have this very, very specific desire for a thief god. If you want, if you want to talk about a thieves guild, try a thieves cathedral. I mean, really, when you have these outposts, I really love the idea of the thieves guild in Elder Scrolls. And when you want to have that, but you have it so much more realistically where you have, we all know why we're here, we all know what we believe in, uh, we are of course worshippers of Bell, we are here to ransack this local village and take from them their valuables and their homes, and in doing so we earn the right to reincarnate in Thief Valhalla as one of Bell's many undead heroic warriors. And of course this also opens up ideas of necromancy, because if you're performing necromancy on say a famous thief or someone who was executed for being a thief or a bandit, you would view that as summoning a champion of Bell to your aid. So there, again, this falls into a bandit spellblade, kind of bloodblade necromancer, boneblade necromancer, who's running around the world trying to summon up this kind of demon horde army to embody Bell and try to be more like him. Going back into the, there are no gentlemen thieves, you know, there are no, aha, well I am a pacifist and I will sneak in like a cat burglar and, and take your valuables. I'm reminded of a story that was told at Howard Days by the Funcom crew when they were talking about their, it, sadly it failed to launch in the sense that it was failed to be picked up, but it was a really cool game that they showcased, which was an actual Conan ARPG, just action game where you play through the life of Conan the Barbarian. And one of them was him encountering this sort of... They were talking about working with the voice actor who recorded the lines for this Prince of Thieves, this character named Taurus of Nemedia. And the voice actor had this image in his head. He had the wrong image for the universe in his head. And so he thought of himself as a gentleman thief. And he had become this character in his head that was, no, he never kills. But that's just not how the universe of the Hyborian Age works. Of course someone will find you. There is no magical sneak eye that's going to close up so that you never make a noise. You're going to have to kill someone to get what you want. And this just really brings it home. And they talked about the voice actor himself having this total mental breakdown because he couldn't handle the brutality of the Hyborian Age. And that I, I just find so... It's so characteristic of the universe, and it's characteristic of Bell as well, because of course Bell would be someone who would champion someone like Taurus of Nemedia, and Taurus of Nemedia was likely a worshipper of Bell. We don't know that for sure, it hasn't been confirmed, but he likely was, and I really like this idea. So taking from others is this kind of form of honor which shows, you know, sort of showcases in this way that he's less of a god of stealthy thieves and more of a god of bandits on the roadside. And we already kind of went over that. Bell is a great example of why it's very, very smart to keep the classification of Conan gods so, so soft and so loose. Because at the end of the day, Bell has morphological qualities in comparison to Yag Kosha, very much in common with Yag Kosha. He could possibly be one of that race. He could be a divine god from a pantheon that split off, as I said before. Or he could be a demon god in disguise as a divine god. We just don't know. What we do know is that Bell is fairly unique and very fun with the philosophy of the people who worship him. Straightforward, in your face. It's just something that... When it comes right down to it, Mafia Valhalla, elephant-headed, six-armed god, heavy metal demon army in the afterlife, justification of necromancy, and go steal shit. I, I just don't have more to say. If you're looking to be a thief and a bully character, then this is your god. The true gods, for the most part, are an interesting geography-specific religion, confined to the mountains of Kazenkion between western Koth and Middle Eastern Zamora. The Kazan hill people are extremely hostile to outsiders. Their pantheon is philosophically elemental in nature and was likely the inspiration for the Four Winds religion in the Conan movie. The first three of the Four Winds are merely metaphors for how one should live their life. Earth is about a vow of poverty. Wind is about exercising intellect over primal urges, thus waiting until marriage to have sex. And water is about respecting human life by following the law, thus breathing life into the civilization by maintaining it. It all sounds like a normal, almost divine religion, until you get to the fourth wind in their elemental pantheon. 
The Wind of Fire, is an eternally hungry demon made of Hellflame that hungers for souls indiscriminately and who has warped the minds of the worshippers to be hypersensitive to any minor infraction as you get to be demon food, punishable offense. And so far, we've gone over demon gods and dark gods and outer gods that would be great for a thief, that would be great for a fun body snatching in a way adventure with a Jujo, or you want to have your cosmic entities Shub and Yun have you covered. Here we come to a special kind of villain, a special kind of evil, the Puritan. Someone who is so corrupted by their faith, so blinded by a genuine, you know, and I'm usually on this channel, some people complain in the comments that I, I go on rants about the benefits of faith. Well, don't worry, here's, here's a rant about blind faith, and how that can truly destroy your mind by turning you into a hyper-neurotic, super-authoritarian, who must, like, if, if your OCD is not pleased, the world is impure and must burn. And that's exactly what you would get with the Kazan Hill people, because you would have this, and I want this to be, and this is how I want to play the Kazan Hill people if I ever get the chance to run a campaign where I use them in a plot or a story or a setting. I want them to be a near enlightenment level civilization. I'm talking public education. I'm talking just almost everything you could want from a resources and needs perspective is for uh, fulfilled. I want them to be very affluent, very wealthy, very well educated, very kind, very polite. I want them to start off as the best people you could possibly meet. And then over time, you just start notice, maybe it starts with some guy's eye twitching because someone didn't wash their hands, or various different odd laws that if people don't sort of practice, you know, you have an escaped criminal, and you go through this whole thing where you're tricked into helping get this escaped criminal. And it's like, well, what did he do? Oh, he walked across the sidewalk before he was given permission. He, or other well, sidewalk. He walked across the road before he was given permission by the local guard. This is the kind of thing, literally jaywalking. It, this is the kind of thing that we need to see from a work of the true gods. So they're hyper-authoritarian, and that's sort of... There's sort of a commentary on what it means to have a culture where redemption or revitalizing one's public or social image isn't something that you're capable of doing. You know, you make one mistake and suddenly everything in your life is a constant state of fear. Will they find out that he jaywalked? Oh yeah, no, that's another one. He jaywalked, but the guard didn't tell anyone, so he could be living in a constant state of panic and fear as a guilty man because he <laughs> he committed such a minor infraction that any time anyone finds out about it, he will be demon food. There's no saying you're sorry. There's no being, in quotes, be better. There's none of that. There's literally just, you messed up once, now you must die. You committed a slight social taboo, which we are now neurotic enough to believe in as this kind of powerful affront against the divine. You may as well be a demonic entity because you have jaywalked. Now you must be slaughtered. Conrad Kurz on speed dial. And it kind of reminds me of, it's kind of like a reverse flash of... Some societies in ancient Greece, which due to the fact that, you know, being a war criminal basically meant that you were part of a, a losing team in a war or in a battle effectively and you were captured, but that happened all the time. So POWs were a very common occurrence and because of this and these uh, city-states lived relatively close to each other and all these people kind of knew each other, they would in many cases not keep criminal records. Of course, this wouldn't be car carried over to Rome. But in ancient Greece, they wouldn't keep criminal records. This would be the opposite. This would be everyone has a criminal record of everything, and you have a record of how suspicious you are. Not even a criminal record. If you had any crimes committed, you would just be fed to the fire demon. But if you had any kind of criminal record, it wouldn't be a criminal record. It would be like the it's the it's the social credit score, and it's how suspicious you are, and you have five marks of suspicion. There's so much area for homebrew. Really expand these neurotic authoritarian elements. Really expand how robotic and it, it's at first it looks beautiful and nice until you realize all the people have to behave like robots or they get fed to a demon. That's the start of this. Oh, and it's it's so good. I need it. The other element, of course, here is the wind of fire who is just, I just love the idea, there's just something so charming about the Kazan Hill people and this entire culture that has been slowly corrupted by this fat, happy fire demon 
that just enjoys his life, consuming souls, eating the guilty, it, just doing that on his own time. He has no desire to leave, no desire to start an empire. If you want the anti-Hastor, it is the Wind of Fire, because he is just happy in his element, consuming random souls, twisting the minds of people to worship him. Th this is, well, I say the anti-Hastor, really the anti ajujo because this is just, this is the example I was talking about earlier. He not only interacts with humans, but the Wind of Fire is so dramatically happy to be here that he doesn't care. He doesn't care if someone is trying to, you know, oh, rid the world over there in Katai or over there in Aqualonia of demonic influence and demonologists. It's, it's just, it's just him. It's just him, just hanging out, just chilling in his little fire pit, waiting to get fed food. And so, also, the contextualization of the Wind of Fire, I should say. There is a cave. It's it's a large mountain civilization. It's a mountain civilization, not a large mountain civilization. But it, it effectively, the demon lives in a cave. So that's the only thing that really is well known about them. I really love the Kazan Hill people. I think they make great villains. I think they're the Hyborian equivalent of, you know, Welcome... I believe, what was it called? Welcome to Pleasant Town? Pleasant Town, Perfectville? Where they go back in time, and it's this idyllic 1950s society, but it's a void of color, but it's like a much darker twist on that, where you go <laughs> you go into the Kazan Hills, and it's like, wow, these people are so well-behaved and so nice, but then you see one guy forget to say thank you after someone gives him food, and uh, he's just dragged off and beaten to near death, and then thrown to a demon for food. I, I just, I can't say more about it. I just really love this concept. I would love to see them used in anyone's campaign. If you enjoyed the concept of this video, you may also want to watch part two of the same series, in which we went over the God of Hate Araman as well as Yun's dear brother Cthulhu. If you'd like to know more about the Conan universe, subscribe to the channel, share the video with a friend, and head over to my Conan Lore Guide playlist, which is designed to be an audiobook of lore for you to listen to in the background of life. It's even organized like an audiobook with chapters. You'll learn about everything from the gods, beastmen, people, and giants that inhabit this age of high adventure. Thank you all for watching, and have a lovely night.